Hey there, and welcome to the Devils and the Dependencies, a quick talk on the software supply chain. My name's Seth Vargo, and I'm an engineer at Google. You can find me at, at Seth Vargo anywhere NFTs are sold. With that, let's go ahead and get started. First, I want to talk about how people think they're going to be hacked. People love to think that they're going to get hacked by someone smashing keys on a keyboard or breaking through layers of encryption and firewall like something you'd see on television. Or they think they're going to be hacked by some obscure privilege escalation vulnerability or container escape that is totally going to pwn their infrastructure and give people root access. And you should definitely care about those things. I want to be clear that these things do exist. But I also want to let you know that as attackers are pretty lazy, we tend to optimize for the path of least resistance. Why would I spend hours trying to brute force your password or penetrate your network when I could just ask you nicely through a carefully crafted phishing email? So what I'm saying is that you should care about those attacks but it's very unlikely that that's going to be the source of your next security vulnerability. Social engineering continues to be one of the easiest ways for attackers to gain unauthorized access to systems. But lately, a new class of attack has begun to emerge which combines social engineering and the software supply chain. The pattern looks something like follows. But I want to be clear, before I show you this, I kind of picked this at random. I searched around for a couple packages and I picked the first thing that came to mind that fit my criteria. I'm not trying to pick on any particular language ecosystem or maintainer. This is just the first thing that I found. And it happens to be React. So React is a kind of a popular front end web framework based in JavaScript. But this could truly happen anywhere. I'll start by looking at the package. One of the things that I want to point out here is there's no terminal. There's no tmux, there's no black background with green ones and zeros scrolling like the matrix. This is just a web browser. What I found here is a second degree dependency, a dependency of a dependency or a doubly transitive dependency, whatever you want to call it, which is pretty popular. Anytime you install React, you're installing this JX tokens package, but it fit my other criteria which is that relative to the popular package, it has much less fame, where fame is an arbitrary measure of GitHub stars. I'm willing to bet that most of the people watching this video or listening live have heard of React. I'm also willing to bet that far fewer people have heard of JS tokens. But it's critically important to React and many other projects in the Node.js ecosystem, but it's significantly less well known. And these two things make it a prime target. The fact that it's a transitive dependency of many projects and the fact that very few people have ever heard of it. The other thing that I tend to look at here is maintainership. Now, in this case, there's pretty clearly one maintainer. Yes, there's two folks on the screen, but there's very clearly one person who's making all of the contributions. Now I've whited out their avatar and name for privacy reasons, but this is a really good indicator to me that this is kind of a benevolent dictator for life project. There's a single maintainer and I could do some more research and find out whether this is part of their full-time job or if this is a side gig. And I can use that to my advantage as part of my social engineering attack. It's very easy to appeal to burnout and maintainer overload when there's a single maintainer or a small number of maintainers on such a critical project in the ecosystem. On the flip side, when there's many, many, many maintainers, tens or even hundreds of maintainers, I can use a slightly different approach. I'll leverage the fact that it's unlikely that all of the maintainers know one another to my advantage, and I'll let them get tripped up over their own politics and approval mechanisms. For example, I might go into the community Slack channel and say, you know, hey, at known maintainer, I was talking to Susan, who's another known maintainer, and she said she was going to approve this, but it's 2 a.m. Do you think you could give it a quick look? And leveraging the fact that um, basically borrowing Susan's trust here, even though Susan never really looked at my code, I'm kind of building trust with this other maintainer and hinting that this is already good to go. You just need, it, need to give it a quick little glance. Both of these strategies are about building trust 
And it's important to know who you're building trust with. So this is where you'll leverage Twitter and social media and GitHub and just general research, LinkedIn, Facebook, et cetera, to try to find information about the maintainers to see if there's particular things that you could be helpful with. Because at this stage of the attack, it's all about being helpful and building trust. So I may work for six months, eight months, even a year to build trust with the maintainer or the maintaining team. I would submit small changes, spelling improvements, gradually working up to larger changes like improving the build system or refactoring the UI, upgrading to the latest version of some framework, etc. At this point, I've earned the trust and respect of the maintainers and the maintenance team, and I'm ready to actually execute my attack. Now, the way I execute the attack largely depends on what I'm trying to achieve here. And there's really about three ways that I would typically do this. Probably the most common is to submit malicious code alongside otherwise benign and useful improvements in the same patch or pull request or, or merge request. Now, you have to recall that I've already earned the trust of the maintainers and I've already submitted a number of useful features. So if I submit, say, a 5,000 line change where three lines have malicious code and the rest is otherwise useful, there's a really high probability that the maintainers are going to skim that review and not read it line by line, give me the benefit of the doubt, and merge that request, especially if that's a feature that's been on the backlog or is of critical importance to the community. Remember, we've already earned trust. That's the key point here. If I just go submit 5,000 line changes to random projects, it's very unlikely they'll be accepted. Here, I'm generally exploiting the maintainer's lack of time and their trust at the same time. No one has time to read 5,000 lines of code and they already trust me, so give it a quick skim and approve. A slightly more aggressive form of this involves being promoted to the maintainer through um, almost like mentalism tactics over time. So I gradually start introducing phrases into like issues and pull requests, targeting the maintainers in a somewhat passive aggressive way where I would say things like, oh, like, hey, at person or, you know, at maintainer, uh, this pull request looks good to me. Just as a reminder, I don't have permissions to merge. Um, or I might say like, oh, you know, hey, at maintainer, just as a reminder, you know, I can't close this issue. I don't have permissions to do so. And you casually build this idea in the maintainer's mind. It's a little bit like the movie Inception, where you want them to come to the realization that if they just gave you committer bit or maintainer bit, their lives would be slightly easier. Um, this doesn't work in all situations because some maintainers really like the, the trust relationship, at which point the first avenue is a much easier exploit. But if you can get maintainer bit or committer bit, you don't need to do any of those crafted attacks. You can make a direct commit um, and in the case of, you know, depending on the source control system, you can even make commits in the past, rewrite the Git history, force push. So there's very little evidence that that change actually made it into the system. It's not like it would be sitting at head. Um, those are the two probably most common attacks. The third attack is very difficult. I only know of it being carried out about twice in my entire career. And it actually involves social engineering on the package registry or the source control system. Uh, so the way this attack works is I generally make a maintainer inaccessible by the platform or the registry or the source repository. Uh, I could do this by gaining access to their email and setting up a filter or changing the email address on the account, for example. There's a number of ways that I, that I might be able to do this, but what I would then do is submit a lot of issues, potentially backdate some issues, create a network of bots to create issues, and then gradually build a case that this project has been abandoned. And I would make that case to the registry, right? I would say, hey, NPM, hey, RubyGems, hey, whatever, this project is abandoned. It's clearly of critical importance to the ecosystem. As you can see, I've made all these commits in the past, again, earning trust. I think I should be the new maintainer. Can you give me access? Again, it doesn't always work. It depends on the policies and the practices of the package ecosystem, but it has worked in the past. Uh, and that's a much more hostile takeover of the package as opposed to the other two, uh, but it has been known to work. So before I move on, I want to say that I've never actually done any of these things that I'll admit on a recording, um, but I do contribute to open source and I always believe in ethical hacking. So I'm not going to do this without getting your consent or the consent of other maintainers before doing something like this. Um, but there are cases of security researchers doing this in a slightly unethical way. Uh, you may remember, I think earlier this year, the University of Minnesota um, was doing what we what are now called the Linux hypocrite commits, where um, <clears throat> they were creating uh, patches um, and, and change lists on the Linux mailing list 
to introduce known security vulnerabilities into the kernel in an attempt to show how easy this would be. Um, and that's not the only case of this, right? We have the event stream attack in 2018, which is very similar to what I described early in the talk, the solar winds attack and the mimecast attack, which I'm sure you're all are very familiar with. Um, a pretty recent attack is a dependency confusion attack, which is where um, a lot of package ecosystems resolve public dependencies first and then private dependencies. So if I'm able to know the name of your internal dependency on your, say, your artifact uh, registry internal instance or something like that, and I can create a public package with the same name, I can get the dependency resolution system to pull in my vulnerable dependency in favor of your local dependency and uh, do a takeover in that way. Uh, a number of security researchers were able to prove this is possible and target Microsoft, Apple, Uber, and Tesla. So my point here is this isn't new. The software supply chain has been vulnerable for a number of years. So the question is, what can we do about it? Well, let's take a look at how code flows from a developer's local machine into production. And I use production in air quotes here because it could also be like a library or package that's being distributed goes to source control, goes to some artifact build process, goes to some registry or a container registry. And at that point, it could become a transit dependency or it could go to production if it's a service. The unfortunate part is that every single one of those green arrows is actually a potential vulnerability point in the software supply chain. If a developer has unchecked access, they can just push bad code right into the source repository, which then filters the whole way through. If your build system is compromised, it could be injecting a vulnerable code or modifying the code before it builds packages. And if your CDN is misconfigured or if someone's squatting on a name that's similar to yours, you could be subject to a Browserify attack, for example. So what, what can we do about it? <clears throat> well, first, we have to be realistic. The software supply chain is expansive and we can't just Thanos snap our fingers and magically make everything secure. This is going to be a journey and we really need a framework and a common language. And at Google, we've been developing just that. We've been developing an external standard that's based on our internal processes for secure code development and distribution. It's called Supply Chain Levels for Software Artifacts, or SALSA for short. SALSA is an incremental framework and common expressive language for measuring and discussing the software supply chain security of a particular artifact. So there's a chart here, but just for example, Salsa level zero represents absolutely no controls whatsoever, and Salsa level four represents the highest degree of confidence that software has not been tampered with. Each of these rows in this table correspond to one or more of the red arrows we saw on the previous slide. In other words, Salsa level four is a mitigation against all of those red arrows. Now, Salsa isn't something that you can like download, install, click a button, and boom, you're secure. Uh, it's actually still in the very early phases, but there is a GitHub action and there's an Azure DevOps integration for creating provenance manifests today. And the Salsa community is rapidly growing. There's many contributors from Google and external organizations that are building the standard for how we describe the security of software and its dependencies. And one of the things that I talked about a lot is that this is a journey. We're not just going to snap our fingers and make the software supply chain secure. And that's one of the best parts of Salsa is that it's non-transitive. So what that means is that even if a dependency is Salsa level zero, no source control, no you know, configured build system, no reproducibility, no hermetability, you can still achieve Salsa level four in your code, your distribution, your binary, your library, because it's non-transitive. So with that, I'm gonna stop there. If you would like to learn more about Salsa or any of the work that Google's doing in this space, you can check out salsa.dev or check out Salsa on GitHub. I've also included a link to the Google white paper that discusses the internal processes that Google's been following since about 2013 that have largely inspired Salsa and also removed some of the mistakes that we've made. Thank you all so much for joining. Again, my name's Seth Vargo. You can find me at, at Seth Vargo on the internet or anywhere where people are arguing about Bitcoin futures. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the event.